Hello everyone and welcome back to Storytime. We will now be reading the second chapter of The Willy Grooves by Terry Tarbox. He is a local author and he has very kindly said that we can read his stories for Storytime. So sit yourselves down, get comfortable and let's enjoy chapter two of The Willy Grooves. The Willy Grooves and the Time Case. Now, the Willy Grooves spent most of their lives feeling a bit confused and I think I should explain why. You see, it has something to do with the way their bodies were designed. A typical willy grew had all the normal bits and pieces. Nose, eyes, feet, knees, mouth and so on. But unlike us humans, theirs were all positioned on the backs of their bodies. That meant that all the things that should have been behind them were in front. Things like shoulder blades, heels, bottoms and spines. To get around this problem, the Willy Grooves decided long ago that in order to avoid bumping into things, not to mention each other, sorry, I said I wouldn't mention each other, oops, I mentioned it again, they decided that they would have to spend their whole lives walking backwards. This, I hope, will explain why they were a touch confused. It doesn't explain why I'm confused, but there you are. I think, well, you must be there, otherwise you wouldn't be reading this, would you? Without a doubt, the most confused Willy Grew was Crowfin. He was Bronglay's left-hand man. He was even seen on some occasions walking forwards, which meant he often had to visit Doc Dickory, who was named after his great-grandmother's favourite nursery rhyme, to have various bumps and bruises treated. Crowfin had no Lady Willy Grew as a partner. He lived alone amongst the roots of a tall oak tree, his front door being just above the ground. Crowfin's favourite pastime was sitting in his favourite chair with his feet on his second favourite stool and counting his blessings. He thought, for example, of how lucky he was not to have caught a cold three weeks ago when Doc Dickory was on holiday. Then he thought about how lucky he was not to have been hit by a falling tree branch and how fortunate it was that the branch hadn't fallen in the first place. On one particular night, as Crowfin sat counting his blessings, he heard a noise coming from outside. It was very late and all the other willy grooves should have been in bed. He decided to take a look. He opened his front door and peered into the darkness. He looked left and right, but saw nothing. Must have been my imagination, although that never made a noise before, he thought. He turned to go back inside, but as he did, he heard the sound again. He listened intently, and this time he heard a voice. A small, quivery voice. Can you tell me where I am without hitting me? The voice said. Then Crowfin saw the creature that had spoken. It was about half his size, with a skinny little orange body, completely hairless. And it had a long face, with its eyes, nose and mouth all scrunched into the bottom half. It looked very frightened. Please, mighty one, please tell me where I am and don't bash me. I don't like being bashed, the creature pleaded. Crowfin said, feeling a bit annoyed, I am a willy grew and we don't bash anybody. You had better come in out of the cold and tell me who you are. He really meant what you are, but didn't want to sound rude. The unfortunate creature sat down by the fire and Crowfin made him a cup of chickweed tea. Now then, little chap, who are you and where do you come from? Crowfin asked. I'm called Cringe and I come from Wimp, the creature told him. I was playing with my dad's time case when there was a flash and I ended up here, wherever here is. But where is Wimp? asked Crowfin. I've never heard of it. Wimp is here, said Cringe, but in a different time. You see, the time case allows my dad to travel across time. It's a special power he has, and it seems like I have it too. That's unbelievable, gasped Crowfin. I don't want to disagree with you, your sirness, in case you give me a sound thrashing. But I'm afraid it's true, said Cringe, cringing. Look said Crowfin impatiently, screwing up his nose and throwing it in the bin. Willy Grooves don't believe in all that sound thrashing stuff. Cringe went on to explain that his name meant one who is frightened of his own shadow, even when he isn't casting one. 
He then looked at Crowfin with tearful eyes and pleaded, Please help me, your largeness. I'm lost and very, very frightened. He then began crying and weeping and sobbing. The tears poured down his skinny orange face. Now, now, said Crowfin, don't take on so. You're safe here with me. You get a good night's sleep and in the morning I'll take you to our leader. He'll know what to do. The little creature fell asleep where he sat. Crowfin looked down at Little Cringe and smiled. No one will bash you in, Willie Grew, he said quietly. Then he too curled up in front of the fire and fell asleep. In the morning, Crowfin woke Cringe and after drinking some tea, they set off to see Bronglay. When they arrived at the leader's home, Bronglay, Yill and their two sons, Rusin and Father, were eating breakfast. When Crowfin entered the room with Cringe holding his hand tightly, the whole family turned and gasped with surprise. What on earth is that? asked Rusin, not being as choosy with his words as Crowfin had been. Crowfin explained the situation as clearly as he could, considering it was morning, which was when he was at his most confused. Yill took pity on Cringe and said, sitting next to him, Don't you worry, my little Satsuma. Bronglay will find a way to get you back to Wimp before you can say your name. Cringe said, Your name! and waited, but nothing happened. This made everybody laugh and they all did a hopping dance around the room until Crowfin bumped into a cupboard, having forgotten how to hop backwards. Then they all sat down to think of a way to help Cringe. All, that is, except Crowfin, who knelt on a chair and faced the wrong way. As they sat and knelt and pondered, Yill sang a little song in a soft voice. It's a lovely time in the chickweed beds. When harvest time is here, when the children dance the whole day long, and we all drink chickwe beer, that beer, and we all drink chickwe beer. When we all go to the clearing and dance our hops and jigs. Where the fiddler plays his fiddle To the sound of breaking twigs Those twigs To the sound of breaking twigs Oh, it's good to be a willy grew With a song all on our lips Except that is for Crowfin For when everybody hops he hips he hips, for when everybody hops, he hips. Now Cringe is such a little chap, with his wrists all skinny and limp. But I know that we will get him back to his mum and dad in Wimp. In Wimp, to his mum and dad in Wimp. All the Willy Grews applauded while Cringe just scratched his head. Right, said Bronglay. Any suggestions? Well, said Crowfin, I don't see how we can send someone across time. I mean, where would we start? We can't give up that easily, said Yill. The rest agreed. I suppose we could try to make one of those time case things if Cringe could describe, could describe it, suggested Rusin. Do you think you could, Cringe? Bronglay asked. I'll try. Cringe replied. It's sort of round, he began, with glass on one side and metal on the other. And underneath the glass there are numbers all around the edge. In the centre there's a screw with two metal sticks attached and these point to the numbers. Wait a minute, exclaimed Jill. That sounds like a clock. But how can a clock transport someone across time? Cringe answered. Many sorries, your kindliness, but in Wimp we call it a time case and my father uses special magic words to make it work. But if it's an ordinary clock that needs your father's magic words, asked Bronglay, how did you make it work? I must have stumbled across the right words, replied Cringe. That would explain part of some of it, said Crowfin, stumbling into the conversation himself and becoming more confused by the minute. 
Bronglay knelt down in front of the little orange creature and explained that if he could remember what he had said, the problem would be solved and he could be home in a flash. At Bronglay's request, Father bought a clock from the kitchen and gave it to Cringe. Now, you sit there and try to remember what you said, said Bronglay. Take your time, my little kumquat, added Yill, who had taken a shine to the unfortunate Cringe. Cringe sat and stared into space, muttering things he might have said. What time is dinner, Mum? When will Dad be home? Is that a knock at the door? I hope nobody decides to bash me today. Is this time case slow? Then suddenly, to everyone's surprise and delight, Cringe disappeared in a flash of orange light. He did it, shouted Father. He did it. But even as they were congratulating each other, there was another orange flash. And when it had cleared, there in the chair, dripping wet, sat little Cringe, his bottom lip quivering. Whatever happened? Yale asked. I d don't know, answered Cringe. But, but I, I went somewhere and it was very dark and wet and it certainly w w wasn't wimp. Then he began to cry. Crowfin put an arm around Cringe. It was Yill's arm and said, I'll get a bath from the towel room. I mean, I'll get a room from the bath towel. He stamped his foot in frustration. Oh, I'll get something to dry him with. And he dashed out of the room. So back to square one, sighed Crowfin a minute later as he dabbed Cringe's face with the towel. Not quite, argued Bronglay. At least we know roughly what he has to say to make the clock work if not how to steer it. We will just have to try again. That could be pretty dangerous, warned Yill. Well, it's either that or he stays here forever, said Bronglay. With that, Cringe began to cry again. So did Crowfin. Don't cry, said Bronglay. We'll think of something. I know. Try to say the same words in a different order. What do you, what do you mean? asked Cringe, sniffling. Say, this time case is slow instructed Bronglay. Cringe did so. There were another two flashes, one when he went and another when he came back. Missed again, said Cringe dejectedly. This time he was covered in some sort of sticky mud. You'd better have a bath before you try again, suggested Yill. But just as she began to lead Cringe to the bathroom, there was another loud, huge flash. And when the smoke cleared, there in the middle of the room stood a huge thing. Yucks, whispered Crowfin. What is that? Before them stood a large brown monster with sticky mud all over its body. Its skin was leathery and glistening. Its eyes were blood red and wobbled around loosely in his deep sockets. And little bubbles came from his shapeless mouth. Crack! it shouted, making everyone jump with fright. It stared at the little group who had huddled together around Bronglay. Then, from somewhere within its wet, squirm body, came the words, Where the dickens am I? And who are you lot? I beg your pardon, said Bronglay, trying to sound confident, which he most certainly wasn't. Well, the monster said, I was sitting quietly in my swamp, pressing some flowers, and poof! I was suddenly here. The willy grew stared. Grark! roared the monster again. Grark indeed, said Crowfin politely. That's the sort of experience that would make anyone say Grark. I'd feel a bit Grarkish myself if that happened, eh, old friend, old pal, old slimy chap? Everyone looked at Crowfin, so he stopped mumbling and scratched his head. It's my, my fault, admitted Cringe nervously. So if, if you're going to pu punch me, get it over with quickly. Punch you, said the monster. I have a good mind to eat you, only I'm a vegetarian. You're not a vegetable, are you, by any chance? Only you put me in mind of a carrot I once ate. You see, I'm a bit peckish. Yill passed the monster a bowl of chickweed, which it pushed, bowl included, into its slobbery mouth. Thanks a lot, it said. That was really tasty. You must give me the recipe. Bronglay assured the monster that none of them were vegetables and asked what its name was. I am called Elbrof, which means someone who gives people bad headaches by shouting Grark a lot. Bronglay welcomed Elbrof to Willy Grew and then said, 
Now, how are we going to get you two back to your own times? What shall we do? I haven't a clue. No sooner had Bronglay spoken that, Elbroth disappeared, disappeared in a large flash. This time, much to everybody's relief, there was no second flash. That's it, shouted Yell excitedly. You said a rhyme and your magic worked. That's the answer. Yes, Crowfin agreed. All you've got to do is think of a rhyme to send little Cringe home to Wimp. Right, said Bronglay. I must concentrate. Then he walked up and down the room while Crowfin walked down and up. Da di da di da di da, muttled Bronglay as he walked, trying to get it right. He tried to think of a rhyme that would send Cringe home to stay and prevent anyone or anything coming back. Crowfin also tried to make some suggestions for a suitable rhyme. What about this little beauty? he asked. Chickweed is green and it isn't blue. Eat some now and everything will be all right in the morning. You big dollop, said Roosin, rolling his eyes. Thank you, said Crowfin, rolling them right back. By now, Cringe had had a bath and his orange skin was gleaming as he came into the room. Have you thought of anything yet, Bronglay? He asked, feeling a bit more confident now that he realised nobody was going to bash him. I think I have, answered Bronglay. So I should say your goodbyes, because if it works, you will never see us again. Cringe thanked everybody for not hitting him or prodding him with sharp sticks. Kissed Yill and then sat and waited for Bronglay to begin his spell. Make it work like it did with the Scracks. Send our friend off, but send nothing back. Wimp is a nice place and everyone knows. This is little cringe and off he goes. The spell worked immediately with the usual flash of orange light as cringe disappeared. The willy grews waited for a few minutes, but nothing else happened. I'll miss little cringe, said Yill, breaking the silence, which he swept up later. They all agreed. I suppose I can go home now. It's all over, said Crowfin, and he headed for the door. But he stopped when Yill said, One thing is bothering me. How do we know Cringe is safely back in Wimp? Bronglay put his hand on her shoulder and said, I guess we'll never know, my little fairy love, but I like to think he is. After everyone had left, Yill sat humming a sad little tune and stared at the chair where Cringe had sat. As she stared, she saw a tiny little flash of orange light above her head. When it faded, a small piece of orange paper drifted down and settled on her lap. She picked it up and read the words. Thank you. I did get home to wimp. So there we go. That was chapter two of The Willy Grooves. Join us later for chapter three. See you soon. Bye bye.